Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. And I invite one of our youth, Alex Kraus, to um, join me as the voice of Simeon in today's reading. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory to your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said this to Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The word of our Lord. Holy Spirit, stir up your people. Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So one of my absolute best friends lives in San Diego with her husband and their 18-month-old daughter, AJ. And given how close I am with her mother, I get to be Auntie Laurel, even though she's not my biological sister. Um, but I call AJ my niece. And I was first able to visit AJ when she was about five weeks old about as old as the 40-day-old baby Jesus in today's story. According to Love Every, the company that creates toys and all kinds of activities for every single stage of infant and child development, and which are designed by child development experts, babies of this age may be able to move their arms symmetrically, follow a moving person with their eyes, respond to sounds and listen to voices for up to 30 seconds. They may notice faces and make brief moments of eye contact. And they communicate 
when they are upset by fussing, screaming, and crying. Now, I didn't know much of any of this when we arrived in San Diego. In fact, having not been around many newborn babies in our adult lives, my husband and I knew very little about what to do regarding little AJ, except maybe that we needed to support her precious little head. So we showed up, fairly clueless, uh, but we were adoring friends slash aunt and uncle. We were kind of like the shepherds in a way. You know, we were familiar with the small, fluffy, four-legged babies, but we were unsure when it came to the human ones. Nonetheless, we ran excitedly to this newborn child, even if we had no idea what to expect. I'm not sure Mary would have let a bunch of dirty shepherds hold the Christ child, but my friend did trust us enough to let us hold this little life that she had carried for nine months in the womb. In fact, she didn't just let us hold AJ, she encouraged us to hold AJ for as long as we could, even. <laughs> to my delight, AJ did enjoy lots of physical contact and snuggles. She would cuddle up against me for a nice long nap more than once that long weekend. And honestly, I felt like I was being spoiled, like I was taking advantage of my friend, but she made it clear that she was definitely the one taking advantage of us. So she could shower and nap and do laundry and just be a normal human again. I told her I didn't mind being taken advantage of. I felt blessed to be this kind of blessing. At the front of the chapel of Cedars Sinai Medical Center, there is these words emblazoned on the side of the wall that say, blessed to be a blessing, both in English and in Hebrew. This is a reference to the book of Genesis, chapter 12, when God calls Abraham and says, I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And ever since my time doing clinical pastoral education, or CPE, at Cedars Sinai, I've kept those words close to my heart. Blessed to be a blessing. How can we show up more for the people we love, I wonder? There's this part of us that always wants to, but when we don't even have the time or energy to fold our laundry, how are we supposed to make time for our friends' and neighbors' needs? There simply isn't enough time or energy to go around. In a capitalistic society, the expectation is often that we give an equal or greater amount to that which we receive. For instance, we give 40 or more hours of labor and supposedly we are paid a wage that is equivalent to our labor. But we know that's not true. We know that labor is exploited, especially labor of black, indigenous, Latine, and other people of color. We know that labor is exploited also from those who already come from poorer backgrounds. But society just tells us to work more and to work harder. People begin to be sucked into the grind culture, which a writer on Medium, Lewis Nathaniel, defines as a culture of raw achievement where longer and longer hours are not just the norm, they are the metric for success. A New York Times article describes it as a culture obsessed with striving. A BBC article describes the hustle culture as the idea that there's always more to strive for, more money to make, a bigger title or promotion to secure, and a higher ceiling to smash. All of these definitions stress the idea that the more I work, the more worth 
I have. Our work becomes tied with our morality, and not just in the sense of the type of work, but really just that you work becomes the basis of whether you're a good human or not. And this really isn't limited to those who are employed outside of the home, given that a study from the University of Akron showed that stay-at-home parents have even higher stress levels than those who are employed. The impact of this grind culture is especially prominent among younger generations. An AFLAC poll in 2022 showed that 59% of American employees experience moderate to severe burnout. This is different from normal stress, right? Burnout inc includes increased levels of anxiety and depression and apathy towards your work. And when broken down by generation, these levels of burnout include 38% of baby boomers, 57% of Gen X, 65% of millennials, and 71% of Gen Z. In other words, adults from 18 to 58 are more likely than not to experience burnout, especially if they're just getting started. I invite you to look around you, to see those who are sitting around you, if you're watching online by yourself, to see the names of others who have commented and who are watching with you. Statistically speaking, three out of five people sitting around you are currently feeling burned out. And maybe you're one of them. And if you are, know this, you are not alone. We're burned out, friends, more likely than not to be feeling increased levels of anxiety, depression, and apathy. And yet, on Tuesday, you're going to start hearing the phrase, let's get back to the grind. We're going to hear it all over, and gone will be our holiday festivities, the gatherings with loved ones, the extravagant feasts, the simple joys of brightly colored lights and baking with grandparents. We will be tucking the holidays into an envelope that we will open again sometime next fall or winter. But in the meantime, it's back to the grind. Blessed? We certainly are. We certainly are. Blessed with jobs, maybe. We're blessed with a nice place to live, maybe. Blessed with a loving family, maybe. But blessed enough to be a blessing? How do we manage that? You know, I keep wondering about the blessing in this story when Simeon and Anna, Anna offer their blessings to the brand new parents holding a 40-day-old baby, bags under their eyes, and smelling of spit-up. There's this internet meme that goes around this time of year where the wise women came after the three wise men bringing fresh diapers, casseroles for the week, and lots of formula. The idea is that it's a little more practical, maybe, than gold and frankincense and myrrh. The wise women really knew what they were doing. And as hilarious as that joke is, it does make me wonder what blessings are worthwhile. I posted a question on Facebook this week asking about acts of kindness that people had received, and here are some of the answers. One friend wrote about the time that her hair was growing back after receiving chemotherapy. She usually left the house with a wig, but this time in a hurry she left without one and was feeling incredibly self-conscious, not wanting to be pitied but she was overcome with emotion when the cashier at the grocery store said in the most genuine way, I love 
your hair. Another friend helped an elderly woman in Abu Dhabi at a bus stop, and when they got to this, on the same bus, she then adopted him as her son for the day. She made sure he had water and gave her her extra subway card and made sure he had directions to his next destination. An internet stranger paid for another friend's medical bills. An overburdened college student couldn't afford the ice cream that she brought to the checkout counter, so the cashier bought it for her. During the 2008 recession, the gift of bread and vegetables every week was a blessing for another couple. And an exhausted mom of two was trying her best to get her kids out the door of a McDonald's play place when she was approached by a perfect-looking grandmother and perfect-looking grandchildren, mom expected to be chastised for the behavior of her extravagant toddler, but instead, perfect grandma offered to grab the baby and the diaper bag and help mom and her two little ones to the car. The grandmother said, I always remember the lady who did this for me many years ago. There were a few common threads in all of these stories, but a couple stood out to me. One was the lack of judgment from the giver, and the second was that they gave what they had. In each of these stories, the recipient was not made to feel less than. They were not deemed pathetic, or incompetent. They were not seen as lazy or undeserving. In all of these interactions, humans saw humans for their true worth. And being humans, they gave them what they could, not what would solve all of their problems, but what they had in that moment, which might have just been kindness, or generosity. Mary and Joseph didn't come from wealth. They came from modest means, and as I walked into the temple that day, people could tell. You see, they brought these two pigeons, these two turtle doves, as we like to sing about. The law of Leviticus prescribed a sacrifice of a lamb but made the exception that if that wasn't a possibility, a couple pigeons would suffice. So they walked in with their pigeons and their baby, and there was nothing really outwardly special about this family, and yet there were two elders in the space that day who noticed them. They were moved by the Holy Spirit, Simeon and Anna. And they each recognized something more in this child. Neither of them questioned why the Messiah, the Savior, would be born to this weary, lower-class couple. They didn't let outward assumptions deter them from the blessings that they knew this child deserved. And sure, Maybe what Mary really needed was a nap and a babysitter. But there is another truth here about being a blessing. We cannot be all things to all people. None of us can do all that needs to be done. Not all of us can pay for another's groceries. Not all of us can help a tired mom wrangle her kids. Not all of us can, ha can offer words that make a lasting and loving impact on someone's life. But what we can learn from Simeon and Anna is that we can be something to someone. When we give what we have in a genuine love-filled way, we can, no, we are a blessing to others. 
Friends, I know who I'm speaking to here, and I know that many of us in this room already give more than we have. My challenge for us is not that we burn ourselves out even more by trying to drain ourselves, being a blessing to those around us, but rather that we simply go into this year giving the gift of our genuine selves, wherever we may be. Can we bless each other with the gift of running errands together? Can we bless each other with the simple act of learning each other's names after church? That's a special goal that the Board of Children, Youth, and Families has, is to learn the names of five families in our church. Can we bless each other with the simple act of receiving a blessing? Yet yeah, allowing yourselves to receive a blessing can be a blessing to the givers. Asking for what we need, friends, allows our community to be the blessing for us. And it all takes courage. It all takes a deep breath. But friends, in 2024, I pray that we remember this. We were not created to bless corporate billionaires. We were built to bless each other. And while we must do what we can to maintain our livelihoods, I pray that we can empower ourselves and each other to be the blessings that God created us to be. We are the village that we've been looking for. We are blessed to be a blessing today and every day to come. May it be so. Amen.